Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone who's dialed in to our first in a series of looking at the key issues that are going to be affecting the United States in the globe in the run up to the November 2020 elections and beyond. We are so thrilled to have as our kickoff speaker, General Joseph Botel. He is CEO and President of Business Executives for National Security. And before that, our four-star general had a distinguished nearly four decade career in which he was commander of U.S. Central Command and commander of U.S. Joint Special Operations Command. His bio is so extensive that if I read through it, we could essentially take up the entire hour. So I'm going to basically leave the introductions with that. I'm going to ask a few questions of General Votel, and then we will be taking questions from the participants. So first of all, thank you and welcome General Votel to our discussion. And the first question we'd like to ask you is, as you look at January 2021, what will be at the top of the president's inbox when it comes to foreign, challenge, foreign policy challenges and security challenges facing the new administration? Thanks, uh, thanks, Halima. It's great. To, it's great to be with you uh, again. And uh, greetings to to everybody that is on the on the on the webcast here the, this morning. It's it's wonderful to wonderful to be with you. I'm coming to you from Washington, uh, D.C. Here, it's pretty quiet. Seem things seem to be under control for the time being. So all all good here. Um, so that I think that's a great great question. And uh, I think this will be a very full inbox for. Uh, whoever occupies the Oval Office in January of, of 2021. But I certainly think there are four big issues that are going to you know, dominate uh, uh, the initial time of, of, the, of the new administration, whether it's a second term for President Trump or whether it is a, a Democratic president, Mr. Biden. Um, first and foremost, I think, will be the pandemic. Uh, I think we do have to look at the pandemic through the lens of a national security issue. Certainly, we're dealing with the domestic aspects of it right now. Uh, but uh, as we are seeing in some reporting here, uh, many of our partners continue to uh, struggle with it. And certainly areas of uh, where there is difficulty with governance and other things are struggling with this or will continue to struggle with this. So the, the global response to this, like we've seen with Ebola and some other things, really needs to take form. And this will be something that will a uh, new president will confront. Certainly the, uh, the economy um, and uh, the concerns about a recession will be something that he will have to have to do. It looks like the stock market seems to be uh, returning uh, from where it, uh, where it was a couple of months ago, uh, but certainly paying attention to uh, keeping us on solid economic uh, 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 ground will be very, very important early on. Uh, third, of course, the social issues here in, in the United States. I, I won't go into too much detail with it. I'm sure you're all paying attention to this. Um, and, and you might wonder why I throw that up in, in kind of a discussion of national security. Uh, frankly, uh, I, I think a lot of our partners are looking at us, uh, uh, looking at the United States and how we deal with these issues uh, as examples of it here. We've led in many of these areas before. And we will continue to do it here in the future. So it will it, it does have an impact. And as I've kind of been reminded, as I've talked to a lot of people, these issues of pandemic, economy, social issues are all interconnected and, uh, and really do uh, have national security implications. I think the fourth one, of course, uh, which is really, I think, a hard uh, national security issue will be China. Uh, and we've certainly seen China in, uh, in the forefront this week with Secretary Pompeo's comments and the president's comments in the Rose Garden the other day about this. And, and this will be, I think, a, a, a significant thing that the, uh, that the new president will, uh, will, have to, uh, will, have to, will have to confront with. Our, our, how we move forward with China, uh, you know, a, a competitor unlike one we've seen before, uh, but one that is rising quickly and that we will, we will have to contend with. I, I, I hope we're going to get into an opportunity to talk about China a little bit more, but let me let me leave it there uh, right now.
And actually, I think China is a very good place to start the conversation because a number of our clients overnight were sending in a lot of questions and they were very focused on the issue of China. The idea of great power competition, can you have a sort of a rising power and established power, the sort of Thucydides trap without there being confrontation? I know a number of your colleagues in the Pentagon have talked about the sort of Thucydides trap idea. We've also had a number of questions come in about the future of the relationship with Hong Kong. What does that mean? Are there flashpoints around the issue of Taiwan? Like, what should we be looking to as the key issues in this relationship in terms of a potential for better relations? Or what could really cause us to become much more on the path to confrontation? Is it South China Sea? Again, is it Taiwan? So if you could just walk us through this relationship, how do you think it will evolve over the next 12 months? Sure. Um, so, you know, it's uh, China looms large. You know, as Halima introduced me, my, my responsibilities were, uh, my last responsibilities were largely in the Middle East. Um, and you might not necessarily think uh, about China there, but frankly, they do loom large in this particular area. What always fascinated me from the time I came into that position in, in, uh, in early 2016, we had periodic presence of Chinese vessels in the, in the region. By the time I left in uh, March of 2019, we had persistent presence of, uh, of Chinese vessels uh, coursing through the waters of the Middle East. And uh, to me, that's a, a great reminder of how, how, uh, how important this competition is that is, uh, that is playing out here right now. So just a little bit about the relationship, and then maybe I'll just touch on a few key areas of risk and, and some areas that, uh, that we ought to be paying attention to. First of all, I think uh, right now uh, the relationship is, um, is, is deteriorating. Uh, it is becoming more uh, more friction uh, uh, fed here than it has been in the past. Uh, we've seen for a number of years now uh, that we've been in, uh, there has been a level of tension, but that tension has been suppressed. And now it is opening, it is falling more into the open friction. Uh, and again, I would point you to the, you know, the comments of the Secretary of State and, uh, and to our president here just a few days ago on this uh, uh, the the uh, rhetoric, and I don't mean that uh, in a negative way, but the, the narrative, the discussion out there is, is a very, very serious one uh, that is taking place. And there are the discussion we have, I think we have taken it up to a level in terms of our criticism of some of the things that China is doing. And of course, it is moving it is into this area. Uh, I've heard, I've, uh, I've talked recently with some experts on the area and they, they, they assess that we really, the, the relationship is at, a, is at a low point and at a most dangerous point and perhaps has been uh, since the opening back in 1971 with President Nixon and, and uh, Mr. Kissinger. Um, it, there is a, a belief, I think, in the national security circles that the strategy to engage and increase the relationship and ties uh, that we've had, we've tried to do with, uh, with China for a long period of time, that is by engaging them, by making them part of this, by making them prosperous, they would join in a, in a more collective and collaborative way, uh, have, has largely not worked. And I think uh, as you look back, I think this has been clear perhaps all the way back to 2008. The primary component of the relationship now is not about partnership, it is about competition. Um, and, uh, and I think that is a really important aspect to, uh, uh, to, to think about. Um, and, you know, certainly uh, this is playing out in intellectual uh, property issues, theft of uh, technology, predatory practices that we are seeing, and then or some of the lawfare type activities that uh, that uh, that China pursues and trying to create new realities, particularly in places like the South China Sea. Um, so, you know, I, I think all of this is going to be exacerbated by uh, by the election season. It's going the rhetoric is going to be worse. Is going to be probably sharper, uh, and this is going to be a topic that is going to remain uh, top of top of the news. Just moving just quickly to some areas of risk and some areas I think we ought to be thinking about here. Uh, I think one of the things that uh, that does you know concern me, I think should concern some of us, is, uh, many of us, is there right now, uh, given this, uh, this competitive nature, there really is a lack of an effective framework to handle the competition and to, and to keep a dialogue going forward with China about their activities in the South China Sea or Hong Kong or these other things right here. I think China views this as uh, as engaging in a discussion 
uh, legitimizes our interests and our presence in the area. Uh, and so there's not a great uh, there's not a great impetus for them to do that. Uh, but in order to move forward, there will have to we will have to find an effective framework uh, that allows us to to address this this aspect of competition. Uh, I think we have to think uh, clearly about deterrence uh, in the area right now. Um, you know, just a few weeks ago, we saw a flare up on the Indian China border uh, between two nuclear powers uh, here, two nuclear countries, and. Uh, uh, that, that uh, while it is, seems to have subsided now, it should be a reminder to us that China is not, af uh, not afraid to bow up. Um, certainly the situation in Hong Kong right now, uh, as they've kind of steadily moved along and has taken incremental steps uh, without uh, seeming repercussions uh, internationally that have pushed back hard on them, have, again, begun to make their actions uh, the norm in terms of this. Uh, we've seen them challenge uh, U.S. vessels in the uh, South China Sea uh, several times. Uh, we had one that departed here a couple months ago as a result of that. Uh, certainly, we have a strong presence here today. Uh, but, but the point I'm trying to make to you is that what, uh, what China is doing is they are approaching this very incrementally, and they are changing, they are changing behavior. They are changing the status uh, in the areas around them. And, uh, and through incremental changes, uh, they, are, they are creating new facts on, on the ground. Of course, you have to ask the question, what does this mean for Taiwan uh, and uh, in, in terms of where they uh, try to go with us? With a, with a U.S. distracted by pandemic and other things right here, is this an opportunity for them? Uh, I think this goes to the idea of the, of the danger of the, of the current, uh, current uh, environment. Um, China is pushing the U.S. in decline narrative, frankly. They are, you know, you, Halima, you made reference to the Thucydides uh, gap here. China is is trying is is supporting that by their narrative. The U.S. is a power in decline, decline right now, and China is rising. I think a third area here is is our partnerships and strategy in the region. Um, you know, uh, uh, we we do need a coherent, collective uh, response by like-minded countries. Uh, India, Australia, Japan, Vietnam. Uh, are all share our concerns on this, but we do need to coalesce this into a strategy and a and a more collective approach. And then finally, I would just say, from the military standpoint, you know, while we have been engaged in in uh, in conflict for the last uh, eighteen or nineteen years in places like Afghanistan or Iraq and some and Syria and some other some other locations, uh, China has used that opportunity to develop their own capability. And while they, I would not necessarily call them a pure competitor, what I would tell you is that we require five, we require uh, uh, prioritization on this and uh, making sure that we can maintain our competitive advantage militarily moving forward. So we will need five to six, maybe even more years of continued capability development to make sure that we can, uh, we can, uh, we can have an effective deterrent uh, capability in the region. Thank you so much. And I want to ask you, I mean, I know you are somebody who is, you know, very nonpartisan, has served in, you know, multiple administrations. Do you think there's a key difference in terms of how a second Trump administration would approach China versus an incoming Biden administration? I mean, some political writers have been saying that actually on the topic of China, that you actually see, you know, both Democrats and Republicans taking a, a tougher line on China. Yeah, I, I think I would agree with that. I think well, I think uh, I think both parties look at China uh, are, are seeing are now seeing China for what it is and the threat that it poses to us. And that and you know how how each of the parties approach it while they have that common view. What could be different, I think, is how each of the each of the parties end up end up approaching that. Uh, I mean, I, I think the uh, the Trump administration calling out some of these important issues here, and and I do think the. Uh, this is a cautious approach, as it, as as it should always be in terms of the things we're doing. But uh, they have they have definitely uh, highlighted uh, you know these uh, these negative aspects uh, that have resulted from the from the relationship that we tried to develop with uh, with China, and and that has I think exposed the problem. And I think it's made people understand just how serious this is. And of course, just looking at our reliance on supply chains and other things going back there most recently in the pandemic, uh, I think is a, is, a, is a really good example of just how, how vulnerable we potentially are.
Thank you. And I now want to turn to an area, I mean, you know so many areas so well, but you have spent so much of your career in the Middle East. And if you think about sort of the 2019, we had a lot of Middle East issues that we were looking at. I mean, we had the attacks on tankers off the coast of the UAE. I think I was with you in an event at Dartmouth over the summer where we were discussing these events and potential risk of a confrontation with Iran. We had the attacks on the Saudi oil facilities in September, and then the killing of Qasem Soleimani in January. And since January, the sort of Middle East narrative is sort of story that have fallen off the front page, obviously overtaken by discussions about the pandemic. How serious are the risks you believe emanating from the Middle East? What should we be watching? We got a lot of questions overnight from clients asking about the attacks that have occurred on the Iranian military and nuclear facilities in the last couple of weeks. What's the potential for some type of unforeseen escalation there? If you put back on your CENTCOM commander hat, what concerns you about the Middle East? And again, the kind of question about how would a Trump administration approach the Middle East, do you think, in a second term and incoming Biden administration? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I think that's a great question. And, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> I just up front, what I would just say is this. And you know, the main idea I want to plant with everybody is that um, we have we retain interests in the, in the Middle East. We can talk about those in a moment. But more importantly, the Middle East is going to play is going to be a location where great power competition is going to play out whether it is the United States and China, the United States and Russia, or perhaps uh, some of the other regional powers that are now exerting themselves, Turkey, for example. Uh, Iran you know, envisions themselves as a potential regional power here right now. But I think it's really important for, for uh, people to get their head around the idea that, um, you know, uh, the it, the, the Middle East is is more important to us than just for the the normal things we think about it. It, it is a real area where we will compete with our with great power competitors, especially China. China's angle into this, of course, will be uh, mostly economic. They are trying to bolster their markets and create their belts and roads and all that kind of stuff. And so we've seen an increase in that. Uh, and they, that will be their angle. Russia, you know, sees uh, the uh, vulnerabilities uh, for us in the Middle East as opportunities to supplant and uh, and uh, undermine uh, our influence in the region. So the most important point I can make is that this will be an area for uh, for uh, for great power competition, and we will have to look at. It. You know, I, I always remind people that you know at the end of the Cold War, or as we approach the end of the Cold War, uh, you know. The, it played out in, in the Middle East, in the Central Asian area, in Afghanistan, uh, for example, here with our support to the Mujahideen uh, that was so devastating against the, the Soviet forces at the time. Um, just in terms of the relationship with Iran, uh, if, if I, I'll just use that term relationship, although it really isn't, uh, it remains tense, but I would say that it is controlled right now. Um, the death of Soleimani, uh, I, as deserving as he as that was, uh, for him, uh, really has not produced a turning point uh, that some had projected that it would, that it would bring the perhaps the Iranians to the table <clears throat> or send a, send a clearer signal <clears throat> that we want to talk or something like that. We, it has not really made a, made a change as a turning point uh, and, uh, with that. And, of course, we, we are continuing to watch things like the Kuds Force and other things that left in the wake of Soleimani in the direction they're going. Uh, one of the trends we have seen is it has some of the groups that Soleimani uh, orchestrated control over now really have a, level more, a higher level of autonomy uh, over themselves. And so we will have to see what that means for Hezbollah, for the Houthis, uh, and how that plays out long term. Um, Iran remains intent on expelling the U.S. from the region. That's really their long term objective uh, so that they can they can, uh, you know, create their influence. And so they will continue to compete with us in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, uh, and of course, in the, <clears throat> in the maritime environment. So the risk of miscalculation, I think, is the one we should be concerned about the most. That is, in the maritime environment, sh ships coming in contact with Iranian fast boats or other things here, uh, another attack uh, onto uh, Onto these areas, I, you know, there there is definitely since the last time we talked about this about a year ago, uh, there is a definite increase in U.S. troop presence in the region, region on the order of you know twenty five to thirty thousand troops. 
Um, and most of those uh, fall into the maritime air defense logistical area. Um, uh, so there has actually been a bolstering up of, of some of that, and it's been sustained right now. We'll see how long that can be sustained. There will be some other requirements. Um, I, I would just uh, close with two final points here is that I think the things we do have to watch in the Middle East is the unity of our partners there. Uh, the Gulf still really, I think, is is uh, is not unified here in terms of, of it. Uh, we are still dealing with the effects of uh, the rift with Qatar, uh, for example. Um, and uh, and that you know, the things that we have tried to do to create unity have not had the had the impacts that we have uh, we have had. And I think as you look around the rest of the area, uh, the signs are are not encouraging. There is no movement on a peace solution in uh, in Syria. Uh, countries like Lebanon are struggling right now. In fact, we've now seen China make overtures to Lebanon. Uh, this this should concern us. Partners, great partners like Jordan are struggling not just with the kind of the policy implications of, a, of an Israeli annexation, but also the lack of support that they are, financial support they are getting from uh, their, uh, their uh, traditional Gulf patrons. Um, and of course, uh, you know, you got a, a human disaster continues to play out in in uh, in Yemen, and uh, we and COVID is present. And while we have, we don't haven't seen the uh, the long term impact of that, is something we have to have to have to uh, have to pay attention to. So we're going to compete here. Uh, the area remains important to us, uh, uh, but there's it's going to be continue to be a troubled area for us. And I guess one more follow up on the Middle East. What do you think the prospects are of resuscitating the Iranian nuclear deal? I mean, do you think the deal was important? And do you think that it's something that can be revived? And do you think it would be important as a potential stabilizer for the Middle East? Yeah, so I, I, if I could just put my military uh, commander hat back on, I mean, uh, whether you agree with the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the nuclear agreement or you don't, from my perspective as the CENTCOM commander at the time, what what it did is it addressed it it addressed a, a pretty pressing threat that we had. It addressed the nuclear threat. It certainly didn't address anything else. But it took one one big thing off the table. And from my perspective, that was that was that was good. We certainly had to deal with the other things. It uh, it allowed us to, you know, to we didn't have to have all a lot of the deterrent capability in the in the region that we had had while we knew that they were pursuing this, and so it allowed us some some options with this. So if you take away the if you take away the, the the agreement, then you have to replace it with something else. And right now, it's being replaced with the you know the twenty five to thirty thousand additional troops we put into the area to safeguard our interests. Uh, so that's that's kind of the trade off here with this. Uh, you know, there certainly was a hope with the uh, with the agreement that it would that that would provide be a platform upon which we could uh, open a dialogue with uh, with Iran. Uh, and that, to me, would be good. Uh, we have been unable to do that. Uh, even a even a tactical dialogue just over a maritime environment, so we kind of know what uh, we had a we had a way to deconflict things at a low level would be uh, would be uh, would be helpful. So you know, I, I I think that it is you know the prospects of it. I I don't know. Um, I I I, um, I I think frankly uh, right now the Iranians and Americans were kind of talking past each other. Uh, on this, uh, I, I, I think of many of our demands are, are, are not uh, be, will not be taken serious by the Iranians until we get either to a second Trump administration or a new a new president is in office. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see uh, what it is. I think there, there has been a, a break in trust here, not just with the Iranians, but certainly with our partners by stepping away from them. So I think that is a, something we'll have to look at as well. Now we're actually getting a number of questions in on Libya, and I think that's actually a good segue to discussing another key strategic issue, which is Russia. I mean, we've seen you know numerous reports of enhanced Russian activity in Libya, particularly with their mercenaries from the Wagner Group. They seem to be playing an incredible role, you know, in the Middle East, in other places like Latin America. Can you comment on, you know, specifically Libya, but then move the conversation to, you know, what is the, the relationship with Russia? How 
what, what are their capabilities in terms of cyber to be disruptive? How will a new administration, again, a Trump administration or a Biden administration, deal with Russia? Yeah, so, you know, that's <clears throat> a great question. So I, I think Libya is uh, is exhibit A in, in complexity here. If I could just, uh, just say that, I mean, if you just look at the situation here, you've got uh, the European Union, you've got the Western powers, you've got Turkey, all lined up here behind the government of national accord here, the GNA, uh, recognized by the U by the UN, and then on the other side, with uh, the Libyan uh, National Army led by ha Haftar, you've got the UAE, you've got Saudi Arabia, you've got Egypt, and you've got Russia uh, that are that are that are 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 linked into that. So what you see right now is you see this competition playing out here right now. Uh, the EU obviously has big concerns with migration, with terrorism, with instability coming out of that area and going into them. Turkey is very focused on the oil aspects of this, as are the Russians. Uh, and Turkey is also concerned about their rights in the Mediterranean. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, so there, what you've got is a variety of actors that are playing out here in this that, uh, frankly, I think is making the situation uh, just more and more complex. And, you know, the, the situation on the ground, the military situation on the ground today, I think, could easily be described as a stalemate here. Uh, Haftar had pushed hard on Tripoli, but it's been repulsed. And now it is into this stalemate uh, situation. And it does not appear, like you see in some of these other areas, a very clear path to how we move this from military activity on the ground into political dialogue to begin to address uh, solutions to this. And ultimately, that's what that's what has to happen here. The United States, uh, you know, we 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 are we support the the GNA is kind of what our policy angle on this is. Uh, but I, I am I am uncertain how how uh, involved we are in trying to move that into a diplomatic effort. I know it certainly is in our interest to do that. Uh, but uh, but uh, I think that is that has been far fetched. But moving to the bigger issue here of, of Russia, uh, in in, uh, in testimony that I gave to Congress here, you know, a year and a half more ago, uh, I, I tried to describe Russia as both um, arsonist and fireman. Uh, that is, they are uh, creating problems, and then they are rushing to put the fires out created by their problems. And in and uh, that may be overly simplistic, but frankly, that is the way I think about Russia's role in this particular area right here. They are they stoke a lot of problems and then they try to come in and try to solve those uh, those problems. As I mentioned uh, just a, a few moments ago here, uh, Russia is really focused on supplanting US influence globally. So if you look at if you look at just the competitive environment here, China is about the economic economic competition largely, largely about economic uh, competition. China, I mean, uh, Russia is about influence, and uh, <clears throat> you know the the issues uh, uh, for them uh, are are really surround that. So it's about it's about principles for for world order. It's about the essence of uh, of regional conflicts. It's about fundamental values that we uh, that we see uh, going out. It's about protection of the of the areas around Russia that uh, um, encroachment by the West or the or the, uh, the United, States, United States, Russia thinks in terms of spheres of influence. The United States thinks in terms of global order. Uh, the Western countries think in terms of global order that are really designed to help you know, commercial activities and, and business and, and economic stuff with rules, responsibility and laws that come along with it. Um, Russia does not look at it, uh, look at it that way. Um, certainly you've seen most recently in the news this idea of the bounties uh, for example, and I and I and I, I I I can't tell you that I have any unique insights into into this. I I never, in my time in uniform, never heard anything related to bounties or anything like that. But yet we did know that the uh, uh, strongly suspect that the Russians were supporting the, the Taliban. There's a couple of reasons for that. They supported the Taliban because they Taliban was fighting ISIS and Russia was concerned about that. So they had a legitimate concern about terrorism. You know, bleeding over into the Central Asian states and ultimately getting to Russia. Uh, that's, that, that's, a, that's a legitimate concern. But they also saw the direction that the U.S. was taking in, in, uh, in Afghanistan. President Trump's strategy has been to move 
us towards a, uh, a political reconciliation between the Taliban and the government of Afghanistan. That has been a pr- main focus of the strategy, and it's the main thing that we focused on while I was in uniform there, and we continue to uh, to do that. Russia has taken, I think, a position to try to disrupt that, to try to make that harder by enabling, by supporting, by providing, uh, you know, uh, broader support to uh, to the Taliban, uh, either politically or information-wise or ideological or actually materially, uh, to make them to make them stronger and allow them to continue to shape uh, the discussions that are that are taking place. And you know, this is. I think what we're seeing play out on the ground in a place like Afghanistan, this is as hard as we expected that it was going to be, uh, and it will continue to be. Uh, it's going to take a lot of perseverance on our part to continue to, uh, to press with this. And Russia is going to try to make this hard for us the whole way, just like we did for them when they were the Soviets and they were in Afghanistan. So this idea of retribution, I think, is important. Um, you mentioned, I'll just close, frankly, talking a little bit about the Wagner Group. And, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, just to relate a quick story to you. Um, in, in Back in Syria in uh, 2018, we had a situation here where we had a, um, a, a group attack into the Syrian Democratic Forces, the elements that we were supporting fighting ISIS and where Americans were. Uh, we had seen the indications of this uh, leading into it. We saw you know, large vehicles. We saw uh, Russian language uh, speaking. Uh, and we used our deconfliction channel with the Russian military to, to ask, hey, what's going on? And, they, and, of course, they knew nothing about this. This was an attack, in my estimation, orchestrated by the Wagner Group, trying to get to oil refineries, oil uh, resources that were behind uh, behind our lines. Uh, and we're intent on using military power to do this. What we discovered was that uh, there were actually two Russian chains of command in uh, in Syria. There was the military chain of command. We had a deconfliction. It was largely a professional communication back and forth. And then there was the, 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 the oligarch network, if you will, that controlled groups like Wagner uh, who were pursuing other objectives that Russia had here. This is the nature of how Russia operates. And it, we really need to understand this. Where we are, we see this in other areas, uh, and and this is the way that uh, that they operate. Uh, and it is extraordinarily dangerous, and it makes it really difficult uh, to, you know, to pursue and preserve our interests where we have them, to, and to operate to uh, operate like this. So, I mean, I, I think it's I think it will continue to be a danger for us. I'm actually going to, in a minute, turn the floor over to my colleague, Mike Eisen, our aerospace and defense analyst. But before I do that, I want to just follow up on the issue, because obviously when you discuss Russia, you have to talk about their cyber capabilities. Can you talk a little bit about Russia's cyber capabilities, but also how big a threat cyber is for U.S. forces? Well, you know, I I think uh, I think it's. it's it's very easy to say that cybersecurity and cyber threat is uh, is growing by the day, and it is of significant concern for us. It's such a it's it is such a concern for the U.S. military that we established Cyber Command here several years ago, uh, that has now developed some very exquisite capabilities um, to uh, to to operate in that domain. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> without getting into a whole lot of detail, like I can tell you during my time at CENTCOM. Uh, in, in our orchestration of operations on the ground and in the air in conjunction with operations in cyberspace, I, I, we definitely moved this into a new realm, and we were extraordinarily well integrated into that. But that's kind of the away game, if you will. That's what we have to do uh, as we're pursuing and protecting our interests abroad. I, I think we also have to think about the home game as well, and this is, I think, uh, extraordinarily, extraordinarily important. Countries like Russia, uh, China, uh, Iran, uh, and you know uh, uh, others that are that are moving in that direction really do present uh, a high order of uh, of uh, cyber threat to us. I, I think I would I would kind of characterize uh, Russia as being at the top of that. Uh, they are very they are very aggressive. They are very good in terms of their capability. They have dedicated a lot of resources uh, to this, and they are. Uh, I think not overly concerned with the ramifications of the things that they are doing. 
uh, and then they have an effective uh, information tool to counter all of that, to just to deny it all, and but continue to do that. And I think certainly we've seen that with uh, the use of attacks on social media and the election process and everything else in our own country right here. Uh, this will continue to be uh, uh, continue to be a real uh, concern for us. So I think the United States we got to think of this in terms of the away game. Uh, which is, you know, the, where we're, we see cyber command and military addressing things here and, and, and the home game in, in terms of, uh, of how we're protecting it. You know, the, the one thing I would, I would highlight to, to you, Alima, and, and to, to those on here is, uh, is the work recently of the congressionally uh, commissioned Cyber Safe Solarium Commission. Um, this I would encourage everyone to take a look at. Uh, in my role here at Benz, uh, we have uh, reached out and talked with them. Uh, they have some excellent, uh, excellent ideas here about this. And, and what they lay out is kind of a layered cyber deterrent strategy for the United States that focuses in on shaping behavior, uh, you know, establishing, making people responsible, um, you know, promoting responsible behavior on in, in cyberspace. Uh, it focuses in on denying benefits of cyberspace to those uh, bad actors. Uh, it, it, it focuses in on securing our networks here at home, developing greater resilience, uh, securing the cyber ecosystem, if you will. And then it, uh, it addresses how we impose costs on those who violate that. Uh, and they have uh, laid out a variety of, of uh, recommendations that I think are excellent. They fall you know, generally in six different areas here. And they include a lot of uh, very close work with uh, with Congress on this. So you know, I I've I've, I've, I've come across this, and I, I think this is a, a quite a good approach to to what we're doing here. But uh, the cyber cybersecurity is going to be an area of significant concern uh, concern for us moving forward. Excellent. And I now would like to invite my colleague Mike Eisen on the line. I think Mike has. One or two questions. Um, Mike, I'm handing the floor over to you. Well, thank you everyone for joining us in General Votel. Thank you for your time. I did have a, a follow-up question on some of your comments earlier. Um, you were talking about when discussing China, a need for five or six more years of real technological development for our defense forces. And one of the biggest questions that I get from the defense investors is this growing concern around the trajectory of defense budgets. And so when thinking about the upcoming elections and all the economic constraints that have been put on our budgets with the stimulus that's gone into play, how, how do you see this playing out um, under the different administrations? And, and how do you think this is possible in a constraint budget environment? Well, uh, I, th I think that's an excellent point, Mike. And, uh, you know, I think as we've, uh, you know, certainly uh, this has been exacerbated by the current pandemic here. Uh, the amount of money that we're spending on this is going to have to, uh, there's going to be a reckoning of this and we're going to have to pay for it. And I think there is an expectation that there is going to be downward pressure on the Department of Defense, uh, Department of Defense budget here. And what that is going to mean is it means we are going to have to uh, be, look much more judiciously at, uh, at the programs that we are uh, moving forward with. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, Choose choose extraordinarily wisely to ensure that we uh, we are we can maintain our competitive advantage moving forward. This is the whole idea behind the 2017 National Defense Strategy is maintaining competitive advantage. So you know we're going to have to do that. I think you're seeing some of this play out right now in the Marine Corps. Uh, again, I'm an Army soldier, but just as a you know a close observer of the Department of Defense, you're seeing. Uh, the current commandant, General Dave Berger, makes some uh, rather uh, uh, pretty profound decisions about the structure of the Marine Corps, uh, moving away artillery organizations, moving away uh, tanks, for example, uh, to free up resources so they can de design the forces that they're going to need into the future. And, uh, and this is, uh, I think, uh, a, a good example of what the, what the, what the department is is going to uh, going to have to do. Uh, recently, I, I was uh, listening to, uh, to uh, uh, the outgoing uh, chief of staff of the uh, 
of the uh, uh, Air Force talk a little bit about that. And he, he highlighted uh, some priorities going forward. We're going to have to think about space, which we just talked about. We're going to have to think of, we have to, we'll have to prioritize things like connectivity, connecting our forces, connecting our headquarters so we can take advantage of the, of the revolution in information uh, that is, that has taken place there. We will have to make some hard decisions about whether we are primarily developing standoff capabilities uh, or whether we are developing penetrating capabilities. Um, you know, as you look at a variety of the legacy systems that we have, they are largely penetrating capabilities. Um, so, um, you know, uh, uh, we will, we hypersonics, uh, those type of things that are more standoffish uh, type of capabilities, we will have to make hard decisions about that going forward. Uh, and of course, we'll also have to make decisions about uh, how we protect our logistics chains. Uh, I don't know if, if one thing has come out of the, the pandemic here, it has been an understanding that under, you know, knowing what our logistics look like uh, and being able to uh, you know, project that, I, I think is uh, it remains a, an extraordinarily important point. You know, part of the part of the issue with places like Iran, for example, Iran has developed capabilities right now that that uh, basically uh, uh, nullify many of the assumptions we've made in the past. Our ability to get in and operate in the Gulf, for example, is it would be challenged, I think, right now by some of the increased missile capabilities and other things that Iran has, uh, has, has introduced. So we have to think in terms of are we going to do this from standoff capabilities or are we going to do it with uh, more penetrating uh, capabilities as we, as we move forward. So, you know, ultimately this is going to be about hard decisions the department is going to have to make. We are going to, and this involves Congress, so we are going to have to let some uh, legacy systems go um, and and move uh, in order to free up resources that uh, uh, that um, that um, uh, we're going to need for new investments. And the final thing, of course, has been the challenge that we always have here, and that is the challenge of rapid acquisition and, and, and integrating innovation into our into our force design. Uh, I, my personal view is uh, that we have we have we have we have done some good things in the last uh, number of years to address that. Um, certainly on the innovation front, uh, but this uh, the acquisition process, our ability to move quickly to respond. Uh, and to develop the capabilities that uh, that we're going to need in the future is, is an area we're going to have to continue to continue to pay a lot of attention to. So, Mike, this is going to be a hard one uh, for the department, but the downward pressure is coming, and we're going to it's going to have to make some very very hard decisions. I'm actually getting quite a few questions in General Votel on the future of the U.S. relationship with NATO and with our European allies. And so, if you could comment on that, and also in the sort of context of you know, what could potentially happen with JCPOA? We're also getting questions about, there seems to be a divergence between the United States and a country like Germany over Russia, over energy access. So, so looking at the broad question of US relations with key allies going forward. Yeah, I think this is, and this is obviously a, <clears throat> a very important one as, uh, as well as it goes to, goes to as, it go, as, as everyone would imagine. <clears throat> so you know, I, I can I can say as a, as an officer who actually served in NATO commands uh, and did that, uh, you know, um, um, you know this the, the uniqueness of of NATO cannot be overstated. And, I, and again, I, I, I don't, I'm not excusing uh, our NATO partners for not paying their share. They certainly have to do that. Uh, they have to they have to contribute. We can't want security more for them than they want for themselves. Uh, frankly, I I absolutely agree with that, but I do think protecting the NATO alliance I think is extraordinarily important for us moving forward. Um, the the dissolution of this I think uh, is good only for uh, actors like Russia, uh, frankly, and it disconnects us from partners that we have relied on for a long period of time. And I think we have to look at partnership as a long term endeavor. Uh, we have benefited from having partners uh, and doing things with partners for a long period of time. And so we have got to continue to, uh, to move in this direction. I know there have been some recent uh, 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 reports and other things about moving U.S. forces. I, I, think we're, you know, I think we all are kind of in the same uh, box with that as to understanding why that's a, why that's a good idea. Um, I, I was, uh, I was I, I've served in, in Europe at a time when we had 
you know, between 200 and 300,000 troops on the ground, uh, where the presence was uh, was ubiquitous. It was everywhere. You saw, you definitely saw this. It's certainly a different situation today where we're in the realm of, uh, you know, 30 to 40,000 troops on the ground right there uh, that, <clears throat> that fit in. But we play an important role in this. And it isn't just the capability, it's the leadership role that we play in, in organizations like NATO. So I, I think this is going to be extraordinarily important moving forward. I, I would I would also tell you that when you look at places like Afghanistan, where we serve at, at, as part of the NATO force there, succeeding in that area is important for NATO. Uh, and, and seeing this through to a political reconciliation, as difficult as it is going to be, is important for NATO uh, to sustain itself, so we, we I, I definitely think we have to we have to look at the look at these partnerships and we have to sustain these uh, moving forward. I, I I don't think a go it alone strategy uh, is the right way in uh, in, uh, in kind of the, 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 uh, the global competition that we're finding ourselves in. I think what we always want to do is we always want to look at our list of partners. We want to look at our competitors' list of partners. We want to make sure ours is always longer and bigger. Uh, than that. And so we've got to continue to develop uh, partnerships as we move forward. You know, in terms of, uh, of some of the divergences that we're seeing with Germany or some others with this, I, you know, I, I, I think a lot of that is in the political realm. A lot of it, I think, is a matter of style, uh, just in terms of, uh, you know, how, how, our, how our president communicates and how it's received by others out there. Uh, that, that's, uh, I think that is, uh, that that is really a, a lot of what that is. I, I, I uh, um, you know, I, I think people look to the United States to be the leader, and when we begin to take roles that look different from that, uh, I think it uh, it it begins to it begins to erode uh, some of the confidence and trust that we've developed over a long period of time. And I think that's a lot of what you're seeing play out. As a follow on to that, and maybe this is sort of a, you know, for me, uh, sort of a big ending question, and then I might see if my colleague Mike has one more question. But there's been a lot of, you know, stories written about democracy in retreat globally. I think Foreign Affairs had this great cover story a couple of years ago, basically saying, is it the end of democracy? And we've seen this sort of rise of populism globally. Can you talk about where you think we are in terms of the whole rule based system that evolved after the Second World War? You know, is it on its last legs? Can it get a resurgence? And does it matter? Well, I I, I do think it matters, and uh, and I, I mean I, I think it is it is uh, it, if you look over again over the sweep of time, seventy to eighty years, I think it is it has uh, it has been a, it has been a positive uh, development to have have uh, have a rules based uh, you know world order here. Uh, of, uh, of responsible countries who can come together, who can resolve conflicts, and uh, and uh, you know address our address our differences as well as the areas where we're very very common to each other. So I, I mean I, I very much uh, view it that way. I, I think what I am concerned about is that um, is that uh, you know a, a, a U.S. dominated, uh, influenced, led world order being replaced by a world order. Um, that is uh, dominated by a country like China. Uh, I mean, if you're okay with all of your data, your cell phones that we all use, all going back to servers in Beijing, and then using that information for whatever purposes they have, um, then maybe this is not a concern. But I, I, I personally think this is a concern. We have seen instances here, and this is uh, where uh, China is using uh, technology, uh, artificial intelligence, um, speedy uh, communications, other things, and they they are using it uh, to uh, to the detriment of their own people. Um, you know, particularly out in the, in the western part of uh, China, the Uyghurs and a variety of others here who have been uh, really imprisoned in their own country here, and that a lot of that has been enabled through uh, through these technologies with us. And I think when we uh, when we allow um, uh, China to get to the front to control these technologies, then they are in the position to write the rules uh, for this. And I think we have to think really, really hard about that. So I, you know, I am a, I'm a, I'm a strong believer in kind of uh, the, the kind of the global based rules uh, 
uh, approach uh, to, 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 uh, to, to order here. You know, just bringing that home to the United States, I am also a strong believer in institutions. Um, you know, I, I, and, and of course, we're, we're seeing some of that play out in our streets uh, right now with some of the discussions and ongoing civil military relations, and the role of the military versus law enforcement, Congress. I, mean, I, I think we have generally been well well served by that. And I am concerned that we are losing, uh, we are losing respect. We are losing the understanding for the institutional architectures of our government that have, uh, that have served us uh, so well for such a long period of time. Do they need to evolve? They certainly do. There's no doubt about that. But uh, institutionally, I, I think we have been, uh, we have been served well by this and uh, I'm concerned about the polarity that's taking uh, that is that seems to be creeping into into that space right now. So my 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 personal view is here. Yeah, we're getting a lot of the final questions and coming in are sort of the the typical sort of what keeps you up at night. And I feel like you've we've had a lot of what keeps you up at night discussion. So I might do a little twist on that. And then, you know what? Obviously, you've talked about the big concerns. What is your greatest source of optimism um, about the U.S., its role, role in the world, our military. So if we can end on sort of like what gets you out of the morning, like excited about the state of affairs, if anything. Yeah, so I, that's a great, great question. And, and you know, I, I, got, I, got the, I always got that question when I was doing you know, what keeps you up at night. I always wish I could have the, the great answer that Secretary Mattis had where, you know, I, I, nothing keeps, I keep people up at night. That's, you know, that kind of response right there, I think, is the, is the best response of it. But, you know, the one thing I was always concerned about in uniform, and I'd still be concerned about it, is missing opportunities, not seeing things in areas where we can move forward out there. To me, this is, uh, this is, uh, this is something that does concern me. Right? The world moves so quickly. Uh, it's so that we are seeing a level of complexity that's uh, that's unmatched in our in our history and in global history right now. So the ability to see where there are opportunities to move forward to protect our interests, to uh, uh, to you know uh, you know move forward in in ways that we want to, I think are the, are the things that, that I'm most concerned about. What does bolster me, I think, is that we we continue to have really great people. Um, you know, uh, in, in in uniform. Uh, I've, I was always bolstered when I went out and met with soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines. I mean, this is they represent our country so well. When they come from communities across the uh, across country, all kinds of economic backgrounds, but uh, almost to a person, uh, they are they are exceptional. My experience uh, just in, since leaving the military, and as Lima said, I'm now the president and CEO of Business Executives for National Security. It puts me in a in a position where I can meet with. Uh, business executives across our country uh, on a regular basis. And again, I, I find myself with the same feeling I had in uniform. These are really high, high quality people that are, you know, concerned about our country, concerned about the direction we're moving and going forward and have great ideas. And so I, I think the thing that is uh, that, I, that you know, where our biggest investments need to be, they need to be in our people. They need to be in our education system. They need to be in our youth. Uh, they need to be in, in making sure that we are developing people uh, who can navigate these complex environments that we're finding ourselves in, and, and and keep us keep us moving forward. Huh? And uh, I, I think I think the material is there, and I think it's up to us now to, to to make sure we're doing everything we can to make sure the younger generations are developing and continuing to move in the direction that uh, that we have. I know some people say, oh, man, they're so sort of the gamer, the gamer generation. I'm not buying any of that. These, these kids are sharp. They are dedicated. They are committed. Um, uh, they care about our country uh, as much as we do, uh, and they are going to be the leaders of the future. Uh, and for me, that's what most people I mean, General Votel, I tell you, I always feel most optimistic when I sit down and have a conversation with you. Um, I cannot thank you. I always feel like I have to thank you for your service, for keeping us safe at night. I remember I actually met you for the first time when you in, were in your role as head of Joint Special Operations Command. And coming from an intelligence community background, I was so awe-inspired by the work that you were doing there and the leadership that you've shown. And so thank you for your service. 
Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being, you know, such big supporters of RBC. You did an amazing event for us last year. We are hoping we can continue to tap your expertise. So thank you. And again, you mentioned Business Executives for National Security. It's an extraordinary organization. And so I, I tell all my clients, it's always worth engaging with that organization. It's a way for the private sector to be really engaged with core national security issues and with the men and women in military leadership. So thank you. We will let everyone get on with their day. Thank you for joining us. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.